Greetings dear people of God at Trinity and beloved friends beyond. Thank you for joining me for this week's Reflections from the Other Side. As you all know, I am a fan of Nadia Bolz Weber. She speaks the truth in love and with humor and wisdom. She looms large, sometimes too large for me, which by the way reminds me of a certain prophet who was not welcome in his own land. In the spirit of staying with the truth of Nadia's words, I saved something she posted not long ago. Little did I know how timely those words would feel to me in the face of the select committee hearings and in the wake of the repeal of Roe v. Wade. I invite you to stay with me as I share those words with you. There's a famous episode, Nadia writes, of The Simpsons titled Homerphobia, where Homer's wife, Marge, makes friends with an interior decorator voiced by the very famous and very gay film director, John Waters. He and Homer make fast friends until Homer finally suspects his new friend is gay. The John Waters character has been trying to tell Homer that he is gay for most of the episode until finally Waters says, Homer, I'm queer, to which Homer replies, you can't call yourself queer, that's our name to make fun of you, and we need it. We need to have the clean and the unclean. We need to know, we need it to know who we are. We need those people to point at whoever those people are. Nadia then points to the gospel story of Jesus casting out an entire legion of demons from a mentally ill man. You might think, she writes, that the town would be happy that this man is now clothed and in his right mind, that he is now one of them. But they're not. They're fearful and furious. Nadia says, as long as he is the town's problem, they don't have to look at their own demons, their own problems. And this is what we do. They need him to be what is unholy so that they can themselves feel holy. They ran Jesus out of town because he took something precious from them, namely the identity they had in relation to the one they deemed unclean. Taking in this message, Nadia is reminded of a similarly, seemingly liberal audience who asked her advice for what to do with the fact that they just hate Trump supporters, to which Nadia responded, no, we don't, not really. Under that thing that feels like hate is gratitude because they get to carry all of our xenophobia for us. They are so much more obviously racist. And since our own racism feels so uncomfortable and shameful, we have to have somewhere to put it. But Jesus will have none of that. He's not about blaming, shaming, scapegoating, othering, ostracizing, judging. He is about belonging, reconciling, forgiving, welcoming, inviting, accepting, and challenging. He's about doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly. He is about actively loving. Which brings me to the U.S. Select Committee hearings on the January 6th attack and to the recent repeal of Roe v. Wade. How many of you have been glued to the hearings decrying the attack and its participants and planners? How many of you have been reeling in the wake of the repeal of Roe v. Wade, decrying the justices who delivered an opinion that seemed arrogant and unapologetic in its nature. When I heard of the Supreme Court's decision, I was with a group of women, friends, relaxing in an idyllic setting, taking a break from our comfortable lives to be together. But then the news hit. Roe v. Wade had been repealed by the Supreme Court we poured over the decision and the concurring opinion. We wept and we railed against the powers that be, and especially we expressed our anger and dismay, our hatred at the justices and the decision those justices made, and our dread over what further damage they might do to other co fundamental constitutional rights relating to contraception, the right to privacy, and same-sex marriage. But after a while we stopped and we looked at ourselves and we listened to ourselves and we all agreed we were going nowhere, hating on others as we were. So we asked ourselves, how can we turn this consuming hatred and anger into positive change? What ultimately can we do now? How can we respond? 
Since then, two responses to the Supreme Court's decision have been especially striking to me as they point to two different ways to respond. The first is a video produced by Planned Parenthood. A solemn voice declares, a storm has been brewing across the country. We have seen it coming. We have seen our freedoms destroyed in states across the land. Now the storm is here. The Supreme Court took away the constitutional right to abortion. But together we can and we must respond by taking back our power. We can fight. We can use our voices and our vote for justice. Together, we are a force of nature. The other shows the Statue of Liberty from behind, waist deep in the ocean, right hand held high, but not carrying the torch, a beacon of hope for travelers, but gesturing obscenely. The caption reads, the Statue of Liberty, last seen walking back to France. Brothers and sisters, let us not turn our backs. Let us not go quietly into this dark night. Let us use our voices and our votes. Let us support groups on the ground getting out the vote. Let us choose hope. We do not have to turn our backs and walk away. There are those who are organizing, strategizing, and mobilizing. Let us join them. We belong together. As Cow Valerie Cower writes, let us honor our rage Today is the day to feel it and to, and, to, uh, and to move it, to talk it and scream it and wail it and sing it. Together, we are going to alchemize this rage into a force the world has not seen. Jesus is not about blaming, shaming, scapegoating, othering, ostracizing, judging. He's about belonging, reconciling, forgiving, welcoming, inviting, accepting, and challenging. He is about doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly. But don't be fooled. Jesus does not let us off the hook. He challenges our need to other. He calls us to actively love. We do not need those people. We need the one who shows us the way of love. We are Jesus' beloved followers. So let us follow in his way. Amen.